Hi guys, this is Critical Care Nurse Skills Review. My name is Jehan and my goal here is to help my fellow Critical Care Nurse Practitioner review the necessary skills needed by a Critical Care Nurse. And this is the continuation of our previous lesson and in this video, we will going to discuss the key points in doing Critical Care Nursing Assessment of the Cardiovascular System, Gastrointestinal System, and Genitourinary System. Okay, a comprehensive examination of the cardiovascular system should be performed daily or every shift. This should include auscultation of the heart sounds and lung bases. Also, assessing the peripheral perfusion, pulses, and the presence of peripheral edema should also be noted. Usually, edema will be present in the lower back and sacrum of the patient that has been supine for a prolonged period, and this is a common finding in those who have critically ill. Spontaneous clearance of edema with accompanying uh, diuresis is usually a sign of an acute episode of sepsis is resolving. Document the observation of heart rate, blood pressure, capillary refills, and uh, your interventions such as fluid and enotrope administration. And document this graphically in order to identify trends. If you are using an electronic documentation, documentation of all of the care is easy and efficient for uh, review. Baseline and serial ECGs are important in patients with ischemic heart disease to assess for ischemic changes associated with acute deterioration of the patient. If available, a transthoracic or TE or transesophageal TOE echocardiography are useful in evaluation of the structure and function of the right and left ventricles and heart valves. The use of goal-directed fluid therapy guided by cardiac output monitoring is controversial but may be beneficial in early sepsis. However, many units lack the required equipment for this. Using of uh, cardiac output is really helpful in fluid therapy, especially for those patients on shock. The clinical response to fluid administration and where available, central venous oxygen saturation may be employed to guide the use of fluids, enotropes, and vasopressors. The use of steroids is expected for a patient with refractory shock. The next system is the gastrointestinal system. Alright, these are the key points. Abdomen and nutrition. The abdomen should be fully examined at least daily as it is a concealed source of infection and subsequent driver of inflammation in critical illness. The presence of surgical drains should be noted and the trends of collection volumes are documented to see if further surgery is required or whether the drain can be removed. Abdominal pressure measurements may be required if abdominal compartment syndrome is suspected upon examination. If available, the serum lactate provides a non-specific indicator of pathologies such as bowel ischemia that are difficult to detect clinically. Nasogastric tube placement should be confirmed on a daily basis by pH testing or chest x-ray if being used for feeding. The NG tube should be removed as soon as it is no longer needed. Bowel sound should routinely checked. Okay, the patient's daily weight should be recorded as a basic nutritional assessment. The typical critical care patient's energy needs are approximately 25 kilocal per kg per day. This may be doubled in severe sepsis, trauma, and burn. Oral intake, NG feeding, and any gastric residual volume should be used to calculate energy intake. If available, dietitian support and the use of feeding guidelines will aid adequate calorie, protein, fat, essential amino acid, and mineral input. If NG feeding fails, consider the use of post-pyloric feeding via tube inserted through the stomach into the proximal small bowel. Bowel output should be recorded and diarrhea noted and tested for infectious organisms such as Clostridium difficile that causes pseudomembranous colitis. Other causes of diarrhea such as overflow, drugs, high osmolar feed, and intestinal ischemia should be considered. Remember that a delayed gastric emptying as indicated by large aspirates from the NG tube 
This is relatively common in critically ill patients and early administration of prokinetics such as metoclopramide or low-dose erythromycin is often required. Early enteral nutrition is recommended to prevent stress ulceration of the stomach and to preserve mucosal integrity. So if there is no indication and your patient having a good bowel sound, no gastric residual, immediately suggest to the healthcare provider that Maybe the patient needs to start early enteral nutrition. Also suggest ranitidine or a proton pump inhibitor such as omeprazole to be given to a ventilated patients who are not yet established on enteral feeding. Parenteral nutrition usually reserved for those patients in whom enteral feeding is uh, contraindicated or failing. The next system is genital urinary system. In here, the urine output should be charted every hour where appropriate. Most urinary catheters are colonized with bacteria, but these are usually not clinically significant. However, catheters should be removed if not required or in the patient who are anuric due to renal failure. The trends in renal function and electrolytes should be examined frequently and correlated with the patient's progress as a whole. The fluid administration should be reviewed and the daily and accumulative fluid balance noted. The use of crystalloids versus colloids fluid is still deb debated. The use of starts based on based colloids does not improve survival and may cause renal impairment. The SAFE study showed on benefits of albumin over saline in all ICU patients and subgroup analysis suggest albumin may reduce mortality in sepsis but increase in a traumatic brain injury. As an ICU nurse, you must be competent doing CRRT or dialysis. In an ICU patient, dialysis or renal replacement therapy may be required in hyperkalemia, fluid overload, uremia, acidosis, or poisoning due to a filtrable toxin. Actually, there is no difference between intermittent hemodialysis or IHD or a continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration or the CVVHD in outcome. But CVVHD may be better tolerated in patients who are cardiovascularly unstable. That is why we are using CRRT mostly in the ICU because most of our patient is unstable and cannot tolerate the traditional hemodialysis or the IHD. Alright, so uh, please remember that key points. If you have time, review thoroughly how to do a standard assessment and then in addition to that, the key points that you must put in mind in assessing patient in the ICU.